from Revelation chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all eyes, there shall no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Our call to worship song, uh, Worthy. Worthy. Thank you, Father, for your presence with us. Your presence with us is day by night, noon, Father. And when we rise, when we set at the end of the day, Father, thank you for your love and directed care towards us, Father. Your intentional compassion towards us, Father. And we just thank you. We thank you for the promises that we grab hold to, Father. The promises uh, all throughout Scripture, Father, all throughout the word, Father, and all throughout the testimony of our lives, of who you've been to us, one by one, name by name. And we pray that each heart here will glorify, will honor, will give you praise for every good and perfect gift comes from you, Father. And we just pray that each heart will lift, lift up unto you, Father, that we see, that we raise our eyes to you to see your beauty, Father, that we lift our ears to you to hear your direction for us, Father. Thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you for this new year upon us, Father. We pray that you, you will guide us to do what is pleasing and what is profitable, Father, um, in this new time, in this blessing that you've given us called time. Father, thank you for each person here, each person who's online with us, Father. Bless the hearts of your people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're blessed to have Elder, Elder Donald today. He's going to um, lead us in our, our word, our sp spoken word today. And, um, and we just pray that your hearts are in tune to hear what the Lord has to say today. And um, offering time. For our offering time today, I've asked Anna to come up. Our offering is for a special reason today. Uh, and Jason sent me a email on it. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I guess she's doing that instead. Okay. So, Anne, have you are for today? Good morning. Good morning, Judge. Happy Good morning. The orders for release for religious leaders set January, January 14th. Sorry. The offering for religious liberty is set for January 14, 2023. Please join us, Jackson, for the members to continue to support and defend this precious freedom. Department of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty works hard all year trying to defend religious freedom and offering is important in continuous these report efforts. I'm sorry. Can anyone Anyone can give an offering from January until March 23. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And um, you know, you know, I, I am the reader of the of the uh, uh, Liberty. Um, here, in, 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 you receive receive relig religious liberty. You're missing a lot. Matter of fact, I would like one day to invite someone from Religious Liberty to come and have our sermon for the day and to bring us up to date on what's happening when it comes to the Sabbath, when it comes to other things that may be difficulty in our past. We're going to ask for the offering. Before I do that, I wanted to invite you. How many parents in here, before you have your 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 offering for Sabbath morning. How many of you include your children? When you sit down and write the check, how many of you have your children or your grandchildren with you explaining to them what you do? That's the only reason that I became faithful in my offering is because my mother would sit down with me. And so, as you think about those things, I, I ask you in the future, think about including your family when you write the check and explain to them what it's for. And then when we ask God to bless the offerings that we give, God has promised that it's going to go for the right purpose. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we collect the offering, I ask you to bless each offering that is given today, that it may go for its intended use to further thy kingdom, to help individuals to bring about salvation to those that don't know the Lord. In Christ's name, amen.
say, we are praying in the light of God. We are praying in the light of God. We are praying in the light of God. We are praying in the light of the light of God. We are praying, praying, we are praying. this new time, this new season before us. The same God who brought you then will bring you now. That same God is more than able. He picked us up. He turned us around. He set our feet on solid ground. That's just who he is. Amen. When I think. When I think about the Lord How we say how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up, turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid He healed me to the uttermost. 
when I think about the Lord, how He picks me up, turns me around, how He placed my feet on solid ground. It makes me want to shout, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. It's time for our morning prayer, but I'm going to take this time for a political announcement, <laughs> my own, and that is, how many of you know that on Wednesday we have prayer meeting? Anybody? Yeah, we do have prayer meeting. It starts at 7 and ends at 8, and we never go over. And the reason we do that is so that uh, people can plan their time around pregnancy. Some of them uh, want to eat or some want to have other things to do. So we make sure we have our prayer meeting start at 7 and end at 8. But let me tell you what we do in our prayer meeting. In our prayer meeting, we make everybody that is there aware of the people in our church that are in need. Not financial need in the hospital, sick. And maybe you can see just a few of them. I mean, it would take me 30 minutes just to talk about all the people in our church. I think about um, uh, Doris and Ken. You know, Doris is really having a rough go of it right now. I think about Walter. So most of you remember Walter. He was one of our elders. and. Uh, I pray today that, that he's still alive. And there's so many more. Boy, it's, it's, it's just a wonderful time for our church to be able to be aware of the needs in our church and then take those names home in your own special worship and pray for them. So tonight, there are a lot now. Um, Jim, do we have a lot of people online? We're having some problems. We have about seven. 
about seven online? Okay. Is Doris and Ken online? Okay, can't tell. That's all right. So let, uh, for those who can kneel, um, then I invite you to kneel, and I'm going to pray for them. To, and I'm asking you folks, too, to remember them in your prayers. And if you'd like one of these pieces of paper, you just see Anna afterwards. And it'll, who? Evelyn. Evelyn. See Evelyn, and she'll give you a copy. And you can read all of the people in our church that are in the hospital, that can't make it to church. And I'll, I'm going to tell you one more thing. You wouldn't believe how many of them literally beg us to call them on the phone, just say hi, or to come by and just say hi and leave. You know, <clears throat> it's just tragic, you know, when we get old <laughs> and we depend on so many people. So as we, at this time, if you want to kneel, otherwise you can set as you are. Our wonderful, wonderful Heavenly Father. We approach you tonight, or today, on this Holy Sabbath day, we approach you in the blood and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That if there's any problems in our lives, anything recorded in the books of heaven, we pray, Lord, that you'll ask the angels to write pardon behind those things, that our names may remain in the book of life. That's why we look forward to your coming, Lord. It'll be a wonderful day when we can kneel at your feet and feel the love coming from you to us. We bring before you this morning all the names of our church members. So many of them, Lord, we don't know if they're going to be here the next day. So many of them are hurting. So many of them are lonely. And so, Lord, we put their names before you. And we know, Lord, that whatever we ask in your name, you have made promises, so many promises, that you will fulfill them. And so we hold you to those promises today. And now, Lord, we ask you to bless us this thy Sabbath day with thy presence, that the Holy Spirit may be amongst us, and that we will feel the presence of the Holy Spirit here by our reverence, is my prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I'll say yes, Lord. Sabbath to worship the Lord. I am so thankful for Jason's family. The beautiful music. You know, nothing makes a worship service so wonderful as the music. One day, when we see Jesus come in the clouds of heaven, we will be speechless. We won't be able to know what to say. It's so fascinating. All be all be able to do is is my sermon today, the prodigal son. I thought it would be appropriate 
because so many of us in this room are making promises and commitments for a new year. Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever tested yourself to see what you're like? Have you ever done that? Getting in your car and go down the road, someone pulls out in front of you, see how you react to it. Sometimes you'd be surprised that I never knew <laughs> that I would act that way. Or uh, you're in the market and someone gets in the line in front of you. You ever got angry? Wanted to go and tell them, get out of the line? It'll tell you a lot about yourself. Sometimes I don't think we know about ourselves until we're placed in situations Look at. I think about a young boy. He was 18 years old. He worked at Dairy Queen. And when he was in there, an elderly woman came in. And as she was waiting to get her ice cream, she dropped a $20 bill out of her purse while she was doing that on the floor. He saw it. And he saw the person behind him pick it up and put him in his pocket. <laughs> so you know what he did? He came right around there. He says, ma'am. And he pulled out a $20 bill out of his own pocket and handed it to her. He says, I think you dropped this. I wonder how we would react. So many, so many problems with us. So many things. When I say I say by myself, and if you knew the difficulties I go through each day, bombarded by temptations, bombarded by things that are disappointing to God, I have to, it's unbelievable, I, I have to pray during the day, in the morning, in the evening, and then I think about the Lord all day and still I fail. I think you're like that too. And that's why I wanted to talk about my sermon today, The Prodigal Son. And the only reason I want to talk about it is because it really helps me to understand about God and his love for me. And uh, if, you, if you go into the Bible, you'll find it. It's not very long. It's found in the book of Luke, the 15th chapter, starting, my favorite part is verse 10, and then going to about verse 24. But in Luke there, it's talking about the parables. The parable of the lost sheep. The parable of the lost coin. And then when Jesus talks about the parable, the prodigal son, what it brings out, it brings out in distinct lines God's pity, his pity and love for those who are straying away from God. Matter of fact, in the prodigal son, it presents the Lord's dealing with those who have once known his father's love and came away. What's separating you from God? Think about that. You know, God gets in the way. He gets in the way on the Sabbath when we want to watch a program that's on, only on Sabbath. He gets in the way when all of a sudden we're eating at a meal and there's nothing but unclean foods. He, he gets in the way when a young man sees a pretty girl other than his wife. God gets in the way. 
Think about how many times God gets in your way. And that's why so many of us wish God would just stay somewhere else because he gets in the way too much, prevents me from happiness and the things I want to do. (sighs) Heavenly Father, we invite the Holy Spirit to be with us because the Holy Spirit is the reason conviction comes to us in the study of thy word. Help us, Lord, to realize how precious the Sabbath is. The Sabbath, Lord, a time when we come aside from everything to spend time with you. And sometimes that gets in the way too, Lord. We need you to come soon because we need to be changed. We need you to change our hearts and make us more like you. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen. Now, in my sermon, I've decided to bring more meaning out of it. I went back to Ellen G. White's writings. I wanted to see what she said about the prodigal son. So I'm going to bring some of those things out and some texts that she's recommended also. But I wanted to start it with a story. It's a true story, a true story of a young man who was getting ready to graduate from college. For many months, he had admitted or admired a beautiful sports car in the dealer showroom. And knowing that his father could well afford it, he told his father that's what he wanted. As graduating day approached, the young man awaited signs that his father had purchased the car for him. Finally, on the day he was to graduate, his father called him into his private study, told him how proud he was and how wonderful a son he was and how much he loved him. Many of us, we don't, our sons and our children don't realize how much we love them. He then handed his son a beautiful wrapped gift box. Curious, but somewhat disappointed, the young man opened the box and found a lovely leather bound Bible with his name embossed on it in gold. He was angry. He raised his voice to his father. He says, with all the money that you have, and what have you given me? You give me a a Bible rather than a sports car that I wanted. He stormed out of the house, left the Bible laying on the table. Many years passed now, and the young man was very successful in the business that he went into. He had a beautiful home and a wonderful family. But thinking back, he realized, thought about his father. He knew his father was old by this time. He then decided that perhaps he should go see him because he hadn't seen him since that graduation day. However, before he could make arrangements, to go and see his father, he received a phone call from the funeral home telling him that his father had passed away and that his father had left everything to him and that he better come home and take care of things. When the son arrived at his father's house, sadness and regret filled his heart He began to search through the father's important documents when he saw there on the table the Bible that his father had given him for graduation. The Bible looked new just as it did years before when his father gave it to him. 
With tears in his eyes, he opened the Bible and began to turn through the pages. His father had carefully underlined a verse, which was Matthew, the seventh chapter, in verse 11. Most of, our, of us know that by heart, which reads, And if ye be an evil, know how to give gifts to your children. How much more your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, gives those who ask him. As the son read through those words in the Bible, a car key dropped out of the back of the Bible. It had a tag on it with a car dealership's name. The same dealer who had the sports car that he wanted so badly for his graduation. On the tag was the date of his graduation and the words written in large print, paid in full. Wonder how many times we disappoint our families. What happens, the emptiness that we leave when we get angry at our fathers or our family and we make the wrong decisions? misinterpret the loveness of our fathers and mothers. A young man had become weary of the restraints of his father's house. Luke 15, verse 11. He thought that the liberty that he had was restricted His father's love and care for him were misinterpreted. And he determined to follow the dictates of his own conscience and inclinations. This youth acknowledged no obligation to his father, expressed no gratitude, yet he claimed the privilege of a child in sharing his father's goods. Isn't that interesting? Ever thought about that? It's not until our children get older that they realize how important is family. They discover the only people that accept them as they are is family. And whenever financial problems arise, Guess who's the only one that sticks around? Family. The inheritance that would befall him at his father's death, he desired to receive it now. He is bent on present enjoyment and cares not for the future. Having obtained the money he goes into a far country. Away, he goes to a far country, away from his father's influence, away from people that his father knew. With money in plenty and liberty to do like he likes, he flatters himself that the desires of his heart is reached. There is no one to say, do not do this, for it will injure you somehow. But do that because it's the right thing to do. Evil companions helped him to splunder himself deeper into sin. And he wasted his substance in righteous living. The Bible tells us of men who profess themselves to be wise but become fools. Romans, the first chapter, verse 22. I think I'll back on my ears. <laughs> oh, I think I went through this <laughs> with my parents. My mother had eight kids. <laughs> oh, 
There's so many of us in there. This is the history of the young man of the parable. The wealth which he had, he has selfishly claimed from his father. He squanders upon harlots. The treasure of his youth, manhood, is wasted. The precious years of life, the strength of his intellect, the bright visions of youth, the spiritual aspirations, all are consumed in lust. How many of you in this room that have gotten older watch your children and wish you could be as joyous and, you know, sprinting here and there and doing this and that? <laughs> so I, I wish I could do I wish I could, I could run. I wish I could jump and all the things that are wasted. A great famine arises in the land, and our prodigal son begins to want. He joins himself to a citizen of the country who sends him into the field to feed swine. To a Jew, this was most mental and degrading of employments. The youth who has boasted of his liberty now finds himself a slave. How many of us in this room think back on our lives and think back on so many things that we wasted? Think of my grandson who graduated from University of Gainesville and never used the degree whatsoever. I was so disappointed to me. Because he could, when he was there, he learned how to speak German, Russian, Spanish, Arabic, because he wanted to be an interpreter. But for some reason, he was led other ways. <laughs> Disappointing. How many of us in this room can think about, go back in your life and say, I started this wonderful job, but I made a mistake and lost it. Or I started a family and made many mistakes and lost it. That's why God presented the parable son to show you what he's like when you decide to put him aside for a little while he found out he is in his worst bondage holding with the cords of sin Proverbs the fifth chapter and verse 22 the glitter and tinsel that enticed him have disappeared he feels the burden of his chains sitting upon the ground in a desolate and famine-stricken <coughs> land, so Ellen White says, with no companions but the swine, he is fain to fill himself with the husk which the beast around him are fed. How would you like to be that hungry? that you'll eat anything. Of the gay companions who flocked around him in his uh, prosperous days and ate and drank at his expense, there is not one left to befriend him. Sometimes I hate people to call me friend because sometimes I think the next thing out of their mouth is, can I borrow some money? Have you ever thought about that? Oh, I think it's time for the Lord to come. Change all this. Change our hearts. You ever ask God to change your heart? Did you know that Ellen G. White 
told us that there is a way to know if God is changing your heart, like you ask. You know what she said that was? Just ask yourself how you treat other people, and you'll know if God is changing your heart. Where now is the riotous joy still his conscience benumbed, his sensibilities, his thought himself of happiness, but now with money spent, no longer with hunger unsatisfied, his pride humbled, with his moral nature dwarfed, with his will weak and untrustworthy, with his finer feelings, seems so dead. He is the most wretched of mortals. What a picture here of a sinner state, so Ellen says. Although surrounded with the blessings of Christ's love, there is nothing but the sinner bent on self-indulgence and sinful pleasures desires so much as separation from God. Reminds me, the pastor had me sent go out visiting people, and uh, he had one person that had come to the church but had been gone for several years. So I went out to see her. She lived with her daughter. Her daughter worked at the university as an engineer. She lived in a $750,000 home. And I came in and asked her if I could pray with her and leave her a few books. She says, Dawn, I'm churched out. Don't bother, I'm churched out. Think about that. I was thinking about our Sabbath school lesson today where it says that God will wipe away our tears. Have you ever thought about that? Why would God have to wipe away our tears? It's only one reason. It's because we that love the Lord and make it we will be so downrouted and disappointed and begin to sob and cry when we see that God is going to destroy Satan and the wicked. It hurts us so badly what God is having to do that God has to perform a miracle and wipe away the tears and sorrow from our Like the ungrateful son, he claims the goods of God as his right. That's what the people back during the end of the living did. They didn't want God around, but they wanted to enjoy the beauty, the fruit, all the things that God had provided. That's what he does with us to do it. We, we get so many wonderful things that we take advantage, not take, we take a, a, a granted, for granted, yes. Thank you, Jason. He takes them as a matter of course and makes no return to God for gratitude, renders no service of love for these things that God gives, as Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, he seeks his home. As the prodigal wanders in a far country, so do sinners seek happiness in, un, in forgetfulness of God. Romans 1, verse 28. I want to repeat that again. So do sinners seek happiness in forgetfulness of God. 
You know, it scares me to go out of my house in the morning and get in my car without asking God to be with me. <laughs> so many things can happen, you know. We think we're vulnerable. We think that we, in our own minds, can think better than anybody else. And all of a sudden, someone runs a stoplight. And we find out. <laughs> Whatever their parents may be, every life centered in self is squandered. Whoever attempts to live apart from God is wasting his substance. He is squandering the precious years, squandering the power of mind and heart and soul, and working to make himself bankrupt for eternity. The man who separates from God that he may serve himself is a slave to mammon. The mind that God created for the companionship of angels has been degraded to the service of that which is earthly and bestial. This is the end of which self-serving sends us. If you have chosen such a life, then you know you have been spending money for that which is not bread, labor for that which is not satisfying. Men have the power today. God makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. Matthew 5, 45. But we in this room, men have the power to shut themselves away from the sunshine and showers of God. So when the sun of righteousness shines and the showers of grace full, fall freely on all of us, we may be separating ourselves from God still in habits that's parched places in the wilderness. The love of God still yearns over those who have chosen to separate the from him. But even though this happens, she says that he sets in operation, God sets in operation influences to bring us back to the Father's house. Praise the Lord for that, huh? The prodigal son in his wretchedness came to himself. The deceptive powers that Satan had exercised over him is now broken. He saw that his suffering was the result of his own folly and said, how many hired hands of my father have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father. Miserable as he was, the prodigal found hope in the conviction of his father's love. It was that love which was drawing him toward home. It's that love that when we in any way separate ourselves from God, it's that love that draws us back to him. So it is the assurance of God's love that constrains the sinner to return to God the goodness of God leadeth us to repentance. Romans, the second chapter, verse 4. Goodness of God that leads us back to God. A golden chain, the mercy, compassion of divine love, is passed around every impure soul, and the Lord declares, I love thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I will draw you. So the son determines to confess his guilt to his father. 
he will go to his father and say, I have sinned against thee and before thee, and I am no worthy to be called thy son. But he adds, showing how stent in his conception of his father's love, he says, just make me a hired hand. That's not what God says to us. God's not going to give you the time to say how unworthy you are when he knows you that you belong to him. The young man turns from the swine herds and husk and he sets his face toward home. Trembling with weakness and faint from hunger, he presses eagerly on his way. He has no covering to conceal his rags. But his misery has conquered pride. As he hurries on to beg a servant's place where he once was a child, little did the gay, thoughtful youth, as he went out from his father's gate, little did he dream of the aches and longings left in his father's heart. I wonder how many times when our children get angry at us and leave, how it leaves an empty part in our hearts. That nothing can satisfy until our children return. When he danced and feasted with his wild companions, little did he think of the shadow that had fallen on his home. And now, as with weary and painful steps, he pursues the homeward way. He knows not that one is watching for his return. But while he is yet a great way off, so Ellen White says, the father discerns his form. Love is a quick of sight, not even the degradation a generation of his years of sin can conceal the sun from his father's eyes. He has compassion and he runs and falls on his neck in longing and clinging embrace. The father will not permit no conspicuous eye to mock at his son's misery and fetter so he takes the beautiful coat off of his own back and puts it around his son. It's his son. That's how God is with us. God is just like the prodigal son's father. The greatest thing that ever happened was when he saw afar off in the, in the field his son coming home. I wanted to close this prodigal son story with another story. Always get you to think about how much God loves you. Especially as you start a new year and make new commitments and promises to your family and to God. G.W. Rosenberg was a itinerant preacher back many years ago. That's how he made his living, preaching off of trains. He'd ride a train to one town, preach, get back on the train, and head to another town. True story. Rosemary tells the story of a train ride he took was more strange than many of the other train rides he took. He was sitting at the back of this train car, and he noticed that there was a young man, a young gentleman, who was sitting a few rows ahead of him. He had this cardboard suitcase stuffed real tied up underneath his seat. 
and it seemed to the preacher that he appeared very anxious. This man would get up, pace the car for a bit, then sit down, and this happened every 10 minutes or so. Finally, Raspberry decided that he would go and have a chat with this young man. So he got up and he asked if he could have a seat next to him and introduced himself. Son, my name is Razenbury. I'm a preacher. You see like, you seem like you've got a lot on your mind. Would you like to talk? Raspberry said it was like opening up a spigot. It just flowed from him. The young man's life story just came pouring out. He said, me and my pa, we didn't get along well. At all when I was coming up, we fussed and fought. Shoot, we'd get in things for no reason at all. One day, we were getting at each other real hard. I can't even remember what it was about when I said something like, well, why don't you just leave? And my daddy said, son, there's the door. Don't let it hit you on the backside on your way out. I didn't realize, I didn't really want to go, but I was so angry that I went to my room packed everything that I could fit in my little cardboard suitcase, and I went to leave. My, yell, my dad yelling back at me and said, son, if you walk out that door, don't ever come back. I was so mad, I left. Things didn't go well for me after that. I kept wandering from one podunk town to another, working, one piddling job and another, and I wasn't doing too good. One night, I was drinking with some of my buddies, and we got the idea to try to rob a liquor store. When we got caught, I was sentenced to prison. But before I got out, I decided to write home to mom and dad I told them I was in prison and about to get out. I said that I was sorry how I had left and for what I did to my family. That I understand if you never want to see me again, but I'll be passing through town. You see, my house is just off the tracks here about 10 miles ahead of us on this train right now as he talked to the preacher. I told them that if they wanted to see me, just tie a white cloth on the tree outside their home. That if they didn't want anything to do with me, I would just go through the town and they never see me again. The pastor, if there's nothing white hanging out there on the tree, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm at the end of my rope. I just don't know what I'm going to do. Raspberry said that as they grew closer, the young man became even more nervous. Finally, the young man nudged the preacher and said, my house is right around the bend. Do you think you could see if there's anything white tied for me there? I just can't look. The preacher said he pressed his forehead up against the window, hoping to see something, anything that was white tied to the tree. And he said, as he turned the corner, it was the most majestic sight he had ever seen. 
Apparently, the family had emptied their house of every towel, every washcloth, every bedspread, every pillowcase, every piece of underwear, everything in the house without flapping on the tree. It was just a tree of white. The preacher called to the boy, come look. As soon as the young man caught a glimpse of the tree, he grabbed his suitcase and ran out the door and leaped off the train car as quickly as he could. The preacher said that the last image he saw was of the young man dragging his cardboard suitcase up the hill and an older couple bursting out of their house to greet him. That's what Ellen White says God is like when so often we choose to allow things in our lives to separate us from God. But she says when we do that, God sets into operation things to bring us back. My prayer this morning, as you make commitments to your family, husbands to your wives and wives to your husbands and mothers and fathers to your children and at night to God that you'll ask God to change your heart ask God to show you how to love your children no matter what difficult situations they get in and ask God to help you learn how to keep the Sabbath day holy. Heavenly Father, there's so many good things you've placed in your word to tell us about how much you love us, how many things in our lives that we've been disappointed to you with it. Help us as a new year comes that our biggest promise and pledge is to you, to know you more and more each hour and each day. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder. All right, we come to the end of our service. You have a blessed Sabbath day. I pray, and um, also a wonderful, safe, and blessed, happy new year um, coming up here in a few hours, and um, we, just, we just pray God's blessing for each and every one of you here, each and every one of you online, and uh, whoever may hear this sometime in the future, um, we just pray, and we know that God is the God of um, the ancient, he is God of our future, he is the God of eternity, so... Um, we, we will end our service with the come, we that love the Lord, marching to Zion. If you're able to stand, uh, let's stand together and sing, marching to Zion.
now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy New Year to you all until we meet again.